you would turn in your psalm books to 291, 291. Two ninety one, let's all sing out. <clears throat> the great physician now is near the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer. Oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. All glory to the dying Lamb, I now believe in Jesus. I love the blessed Savior's name, I love the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. His name dispels my guilt and fear, no other name but Jesus. Oh, how my soul delights to hear the charming name of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song, sweetest name on mortal tongue, Sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. And when to that bright world above we rise to see our Jesus, we'll sing around the throne of love, His name, the name of Jesus. Sweetest note in Sarah's song, Sweetest name on mortal tongue, sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. Number 477. <coughs> 477. After this song, we're going to ask Brother Buddy to lead us in prayer. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart.
pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful we can come to you in prayer at this time. Thanking you, Father, for all the many blessings that you've blessed us with. And we're thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that we can assemble here and that we have the privilege to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask thy blessings on this congregation that we will always be able to do this. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with each one of us that we might bring some soul to Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all of the senior citizens of our number that are not able to be here, and we ask thy blessings upon them that they, they might be able to assemble here with us soon. And for those that chose not to be with us for some reason, we pray, Heavenly Father, for them that they might come back and make things right. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the little children of this congregation and pray that they will be brought up, be brought to church, learn the truth, and teach it to their children. Thank you for all of the preachers here, song leaders and teachers in each member and help us all to strive to do your will. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our servicemen and women, and we ask thy blessings upon them and that this war might be over soon. We pray, pray for all of our enemies that the day may come, Father, when we can live in peace and and not have war. Thank you for Sean. I ask you to bless him, Heavenly Father, that he will bring us a lesson that will lift us up and help us to be better Christians. Continue to bless us. and There's so many things that we need to thank you for and, and ask your help in. And most of all, Help us to try to bring someone to Christ and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would mark number 907. Nine oh seven is the song of encouragement. Then turn to number five fourteen, five one four. Five fourteen. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed to His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. So happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever. in his beauty, the King in whose law I delight, whose lovingly guardeth my footsteps, 
and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I'll read the first 12 verses of Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's good to see the good crowd here this morning, and I want to remind everyone as I've been trying to find an update on our brethren in Jamaica concerning the hurricanes and the storms that they have been facing, I finally got an email just the other night concerning them. We need to remember them in our prayers. Uh, According to the email, no one was hurt or injured in uh, the past hurricane, Hurricane Ivan, that uh, passed uh, very close to the island of Jamaica. However, the church building there in Kingston was just destroyed. The uh, roof was ripped off the top and the rest of it was just destroyed by the rains. And so uh, many of the uh, the neighborhoods of the members that were in uh, smaller houses, those neighborhoods are gone. They're destroyed. Pretty much the entire congregation stayed in Cliff Martin's house. If you remember the video that I showed you, it was a pretty big house. And so they stayed in the house during the hurricane. They had some leaks on their roof, but nothing major happened to the house because it's pretty sturdy. Uh, some roads of uh, in the mountain communities are, have fallen trees, but as far as Cliff Martin knows, all are safe. So there were no injuries, physical injuries, uh, to the congregation, but their church building that was seen in the video that I showed during our... <clears throat> When we went on our campaign, it's totally gone. It's totally destroyed. So they're going to have to rebuild. And uh, they're already a poor people to begin with. So we need to remember them in our prayers as, as we need to remember also our brethren in the United States who have faced uh, these hurricanes. And it looks like some more are coming. They predicted a heavy hurricane season, and sure enough, it is happening. So we need to be mindful of those things. We need to be mindful of one another as far as sicknesses. A lot of people wiping their eyes, wiping their nose, sneezing because of allergies. I'm dealing with a little bit myself, but uh, we need to remember those who are sick and those who are going through some difficulties as well. As you look at Matthew chapter 5, you have here the beginning of one of the most powerful sermons Jesus ever preached. It's the longest recorded sermon, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That is called the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus uh, is giving what has been known as the Beatitudes, the attitudes of those who would constitute disciples, those who would be citizens in His kingdom, it's very interesting that He begins in verse 3, Matthew 5 and verse 3, and He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs 
is the kingdom of heaven. He begins with this blessedness. And he says the poor in spirit will have the kingdom of heaven. I want you to keep in mind the word blessed. Keep in mind the word poor and the phrase poor in spirit. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 5, as Jesus is talking about the passages that He is fulfilling concerning the work of the Messiah, He says in Matthew 11 and verse 5, The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor, notice that, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Keep that word poor in mind. Let's examine closely the word blessed and the words poor. The word blessed in the original language of the Greek uh, language is a word that is sometimes translated happy. But that really doesn't convey fully the meaning of the word. It's a good starting point, but it doesn't really convey the condition there. Blessed means fortunate, privileged recipient of divine favor or spiritual prosperity. Spiritual prosperity. As you look at that, in contrast to the poor in spirit, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, the Greeks had two words for poor. One word for poor means a poor person, someone who is needy, one who struggles for daily existence and has nothing extra. In other words, it's talking about somebody living, we would say, from paycheck to paycheck. They don't have anything extra. Poor. That is not the Greek word that is used here. There is another Greek word. That second Greek word means a beggar. One who is dependent on others for support. Destitute of wealth, influence, position, and honor. Powerless to accomplish a goal. This is the word that is used in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Now when you have the understanding of those words, here's how the passage reads. Spiritually prosperous are those who are spiritually destitute. Spiritually prosperous are those who are spiritually destitute. They are beggars in the eyes of God. They are destitute in the eyes of God. He's talking about a disposition. He's talking about a mindset in where the person recognizes that they are in complete and total reliance upon God and the salvation that He provides. And it's very interesting, he begins the Sermon on the, on the Mount with that verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Notice, he says poor in spirit. He's not talking about necessarily uh, physical poverty, financial poverty. He's talking about a mindset. The poor in spirit. The spiritual beggar. The one who is destitute of spiritual wealth. Spiritual influence, spiritual position, and spiritual honor. One word summation of that is the very, very humble. That's what he's talking about. And he's saying you've got to have this mindset at the very beginning. You have to have this attitude of poverty of spirit before you can receive the rest of my teaching and be my follower. You have to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt before God. And when you realize that and you have, the, you have that attitude of spiritual bankruptcy and being a spiritual beggar, a beggar is reaching out his hand looking for something. Looking for something that they need. They have to have to survive. And that is what Jesus is saying concerning those who will be those in His kingdom. You have to have this attitude about yourself. And realize that I can and God can provide you spiritually what you need to be 
rich. We'll talk about that towards the end of our sermon. So he's saying you have to have this attitude of humility and say, Lord, I need you. I need instruction. I need guidance. I need to be taught. I need to have your will in my life. Those who have that attitude, he says in Matthew 5 and verse 3, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The attitude of being poor in spirit. That is the same word that's used in Matthew 11 and verse 5 where he says, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Does that mean Jesus wasn't preaching to the rich? Well, surely not. Jesus preached to everyone, rich and poor, physically. But the poor in spirit were the ones who say, we need it. We understand we need it. We need the gospel. We need to have God's will in our life. But we need to understand why that we need to recognize that we are poor in spirit. The poor in spirit refers to people who realize that they are totally spiritual beggars before the pure and holy God that we serve. You can't understand this without understanding God's attitude towards sin. You have to understand God's attitude towards rebellion. We have watered down sin and rebellion to the point of it's just like making a mistake in our society. It's just a bad habit. We need to understand the way God views sin. Look at Habakkuk 1 and verse 13 in the Old Testament. Habakkuk 1 and verse 13. The prophet here is saying concerning God, Habakkuk 1 13, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. You cannot look upon it. Your eyes are of such purity, talking about God. You cannot behold evil. And that's talking about looking at something in a favorable sense. God cannot look upon something in a favorable sense that is evil. And He cannot look upon wickedness. Think of things that we see. We might see a really bad accident on the highway. And a person is just really hurt. And they, their, their body has been really mangled in this accident. We can't look upon that. We have to turn away. Because of the reaction that we have. And that is the way God is towards sin. He cannot look upon it favorably. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 John 1 and verse 5. The Apostle John says basically the same thing, but in different words. 1 John 1 and verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. God is light. Absolute purity. Absolute perfection. And in Him is no darkness at all. That is sin, corruption, anything that is immoral. He is absolute purity and in Him is no darkness at all. And when we understand that, that is describing the holiness of God. He cannot look favorably upon that which is sinful, that which is corrupt, And He is absolute perfection, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Now you contrast that with our condition before Him. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 46. Solomon says, For there is no one who does not sin. No one who does not sin. Psalm 53 and verse 3. Psalm 53 and verse 3, Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Talking about the wickedness of humanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, For there is not a just man on the earth who does good and does not sin. The universal Nature of sin. Everyone is infected with that who commits sin. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. That great chapter about the suffering servant talks about our condition. The reason why he is suffering is because of us. 
Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why the servant Christ was suffering. Because all of our sins, all of our iniquities were laid upon him. We are like sheep that have gone astray. We have rebelled. And you know, even though people might be good, goodness apart from the will of God is described in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah 64 and verse 6. Here is goodness apart from God's will. But we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags or filthy garments. We all fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. All the righteous things that people come up with, apart from God's will, is like filthy garments at best. They are like filthy garments. We are an unclean thing in the eyes of God. It's no wonder why then the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous no, not one. He's quoting from Psalm 53, 3. He says in Romans 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Notice what it does not say. Romans 3, 23 does not say, For all have been born in sin. We're not born in that condition. All have sinned. That's an action word. That's what we have done. We became sinners when we sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One of the words for sin is a word that means to miss the mark. God has set up a target as, as it were. And we are like an archer trying to hit that target. And we have missed. We have sinned. We have violated the will of God. And when we realize that, when we realize our condition and we see sin for what it really is and what it's really done for us, then we will be poor in spirit. We will realize that we are spiritual beggars before a holy, pure, and righteous God. Being poor in spirit is the total opposite of pride and being self-sufficient. It's the total opposite of that. And we must understand that. We as Americans, we are very self-sufficient people. We like to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, as it were. Uh, we like to do things on our own. And we have an arrogance about us. And that is the very opposite of the attitude of being poor in spirit. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. The wise man said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is there and it pushes us over the edge, so to speak. Proverbs 29 and verse 23. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. It's the very opposite of the way we think. We think if we are prideful, we will be exalted. And we exalt ourselves in our own mind. The very opposite is true in the eyes of God. Man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. God will exalt the humble, those who are poor in spirit. Obadiah verse 3. Obadiah only has one chapter. Obadiah verse 3. The prophet, God through the prophet Obadiah says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. Talking about those proud people who had their fortified cities among the rocks and they thought they were impenetrable. The pride of your heart has deceived you. It will give you a false sense of security. And God is letting us know through these passages that we cannot be prideful in His eyes. There is no boasting. There is no bragging. We are spiritual beggars. We are spiritually destitute. We are poor in spirit. Let's look at some biblical examples of people being poor in in spirits. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. 
Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus is about to talk to a Gentile woman. Jesus' message and His mission was primarily while He was on earth to the Jewish people. He went to the Jews first. Then the message spread to the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Zidon. Verse 22, Behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to Him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And she is crying out to the Lord to have mercy. Calls Him Lord, which is the word for Master. Son of David, that's a messianic title, referring to Him as the Messiah. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Verse 23 but he answered her not a word. He wasn't being unkind. He was trying to prove a point. He was trying to show her humility to his disciples and also teach her a lesson as well. He answered her not a word, verse 23, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. So they might have been a little bit embarrassed about this woman crying out, uh, to Christ, and they see that Christ is not responding to her uh, immediately, so they think, well, maybe we need to send her away. Verse 24, But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, his primary mission while he was on earth was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to the Jewish individuals. Verse 25, She came and she worshipped him, saying, Lord, Help me. Verse 26. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Verse 27. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus here is saying to her, I am serving the children. It's not right to take the bread, the food that belongs to the children, and give it to the little dogs. Now remember, in this culture, Jews looked down upon Gentiles and called them dogs. But this term, little dogs, is an endearing term. It's a, a, a term that refers to a pet, an animal that is close to you that you care about. And he's proving a point. He's not insulting her. He's trying to get her faith to come out and to show her poverty of spirit. He says it's not good to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. Verse 27, she, she didn't get angry and say, how dare you call me that? She was poor in spirit. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table." Her poverty of spirit. She was poor. She was a beggar. Saying, I need your help. I rely totally upon you. Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. See, Christ knew what was going to happen. That's why He orchestrated this whole thing so that she would come to terms with her spiritual poverty and to show a lesson to his disciples who would later on be arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They needed this lesson. They needed to learn this. She was poor in spirit. Let's look at another example. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus gives a parable. Also, He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Here's the reason why this parable is given, we are told. He's talking about people who trust in themselves. They trust in themselves that they are righteous and they look down upon everyone else. Spiritual snobbery. The spiritual pride. 
as we said earlier, the very opposite of being poor in spirit. Verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And it's very significant that he says that one was a Pharisee. The Pharisees prided themselves on being hyper-religious, super-religious and devout. And the other one, a tax collector, was someone in that society that was despised. The Jews hated the tax collectors because they worked for the Roman Empire and they were considered traitors to their people. And as you read this uh, verse at the beginning, the Jewish people who were hearing this parable for the first time were thinking in their minds, well, the Pharisee is going to be the hero. And this tax collector, he's scum of the earth. He's going to be the bad guy. That's what they were thinking. Because that was the mindset. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice that. He prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. This man had an eye problem that LASIK surgery could not help. No corrective lenses for this man's problem. Notice how many times he uses the personal pronoun I. The focus of his prayer is on himself. He's basically saying, God, look how fortunate you are to have me. Look at how wonderful I am. I'm glad I'm not like other people. Extortioners, these unjust, adulterers, sexual immoral, immoral people, or even this tax collector over here. I'm glad I'm not like him. Look at me, Lord, verse 12. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I go to church every Sunday, as we use the term. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'm there. I give every Sunday. I sing praises to God. I'm a very devout individual. You're very fortunate to have me, Lord. Preachers are some of the world's worst about patting themselves on the back and bragging about their past accomplishments. This is a lesson that they need to hear. Look at verse 13. The tax collector, standing afar off, notice that. He didn't want to be the center of attention. Would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven Humility, but beat upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Beating upon the breast was a sign of great grief and sorrow and humiliation. He was sorrowful for his sins. He wouldn't even look up into heaven. He didn't want to be the center of attention. He wasn't praying thus with himself. And the only time he used the word me to describe himself, he called himself a sinner. God, be merciful to me. The focus of the prayer was on God. I need your mercy. Look at me. I'm a sinner. Spiritual poverty. The poor in spirit. Verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He humbled himself. He realized his unworthiness before God. Wouldn't even look up into heaven. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, we can't boast Ephesians 2 and verse 9. Salvation is by grace through faith and obedient faith. But there is no boasting. There's no bragging. How can there be if we understand that we are spiritual beggars before God. And sometimes members of the church, if we're not careful, brethren, we can get this attitude with one another and with people who are outside. And we can look down upon other people, especially those who are very, very conservative and they have certain convictions that they hold that other members of the church do not hold and they can develop a spiritual arrogance and look down their noses at other brethren who don't hold those same convictions. They say, well, we don't send our children to public schools. We don't do that. 
And they look down upon those who do. Or vice versa. Those who send their children to public schools. Oh, we don't homeschool. Our children are strong enough to go to public schools and not to be influenced. And they look down upon those who homeschool. Or uh, they have the attitude, some, sometimes among uh, women this can happen, uh, women who do not wear pants to church services, and they'll look down upon women who do. And I'm not talking about immodest pants. No one should be wearing immodest pants anywhere, especially worship service. But those who have the convictions, they're not going to wear pants in any form to the worship service, and they look down upon those who do. Oh, uh, uh, we don't wear pants to services. And they look down on those who do. The spiritual arrogance and snobbery and think that you're just a little bit above everyone else because you don't follow, they don't follow your certain uh, convictions. Uh, we don't watch TV. And, and they look on, down on those who, who do. Now, there's a lot of bad things on television and we need to be aware of that. But there's some good things on television. I watched a good program this morning put on by brethren. Taught the truth. There's some good things. But they have that arrogance about themselves. Uh, we don't do this. And they look down on those who do. And, and, and they have this attitude. And they're inadvertently teaching their children to have the same attitude. They're not intending to. But they're teaching their children to have this spiritual arrogance about themselves. And, and to look down upon their, their fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who are young people. And say, well, we don't do those things. And kind of just snoop the nose at them. We don't do those things. We're a little, a little bit better. That's a wrong attitude, brethren. That's a wrong attitude. We need to be teaching our children, and we're so focused in our society about teaching them self-esteem. They got to feel good about themselves. But brethren, we need to teach them humility too. To be humble, not prideful. You see, Satan, if he can't get you any other way, he'll get you to be proud of being a Christian. To be proud that you're righteous, then He's got you. Then He's got you. Then I find myself, you know, watching the news or reading a newspaper and I look at the things that are going on. and You know, homosexuality, abortion, immorality, people getting away with murder, literally. Looking at those things and looking at, you know, maybe watching the television show Cops and seeing those criminals acting the fool. And I look at those things and I say, man, I'm glad I'm not like them. And I developed the same attitude as the Pharisees. And that's sin. I have left behind the poverty of spirit and I've set myself above everyone else. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Because the blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. We'll close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though He was rich... When he was in heaven, he was rich. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. That's that Greek word for a beggar. Christ became a beggar. That you through his poverty might become rich. Those riches only await. All those spiritual blessings only await those who are poor in spirit. Spiritual beggars. Those who are humble enough to believe in Jesus Christ, recognizing their own sin and willing to confess Him that He is the Son of God, repent of the sins that they have committed in their life, recognize their own unrighteousness and their sinful condition, and be willing to be immersed in water. That is a very humbling experience to allow someone to immerse you, dip you in water. That's humbling. And willing to be immersed in water so the blood of Christ can remove all of your sins and that He will add you to His one body, the church. And as Christians, we must maintain throughout our entire life 
this attitude of humility, this poverty of spirit, because once we get this arrogant attitude in our minds, we don't think we need to improve because we're a little bit better than everyone else. And that's sinful and wrong. If you need to develop once again that attitude of poverty of spirit, if you need to repent and come back to the Lord, come. The choice is yours while we stand and while we sing. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give. Loving, tender voice obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke, his hand is on you laying, light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Be seated. Thank you, Sean. If you would turn to number 350, 350. Three fifty. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. There Dear God, thanks for all many things you've given us. Lord, help us to reflect on Christ's body, how he was bled and beaten and suffered, 
Help us to take this bread in a manner that is well pleasing to you and trust in him. Amen. Dear God, we love you and we want to thank you for everything you've done for us and thank you for sending your son to die for us. And as we take this juice, help us not to let him die in vain and take it in a way that's pleasing to you. And in his name we pray. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the material blessings that you bless us with each day. I pray as we give this morning that we will do so with a cheerful heart and that this money might be used to spread your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's really good to see everybody here this morning. I want to thank you, Sean, for this morning's lesson. We'd like to welcome all the visitors. We hope you'll stick around. Uh, and stay for class immediately following worship service here and let us get to know you better. Uh, I have a few announcements here. Uh, first of all, uh, Brother Charlie and Sonda Green are currently worshiping with another congregation. They have not yet moved their membership, but uh, we should let them know that they're missed and hope they'll come back soon. Uh, Josh Duncan's aunt, uh, Treva Simpson, had heart failure uh, and is in ICU at, in the hospital in Louisville. I have no other information, but we need to remember her in our prayers. Uh, a group of members here went to see Coy Frazier, and uh, I'm glad to report that he's doing better. Uh, he's still in the nursing home, but doing much better. Uh, in Centerville uh, Church of Christ, Ladies' Day is November 5th and 6th. Uh, Sister Sarah Fallis uh, will be the speaker. We all met her when uh, he filled in for Sean one time. Uh, the cost is $30, but that includes a Friday night meal, room, and a Saturday breakfast. If you have any questions, uh, see Sandy or Jennifer. And I was given a thank you note uh, from Josh and Melissa uh, thanking, you, thanking us so very much for our generosity and love that was shown last Sunday evening, and they want us to know that they feel blessed to be a part of a, a caring family here, and that they love us all, and want to thank us for the shower. Uh, if there's any more announcements, uh, give them to me after church, and I'll announce them this evening. Uh, will you bow with me, please? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for this beautiful Lord's Day that we can gather together and worship and sing praises unto you. The Lord bless us here in Roy City. Help us to stay strong in our faith. Help us to always increase our knowledge of the Scripture. Help us that we'll be better prepared to lead other souls to Christ. Dear Lord, forgive us of our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>